Acts chapter 20, verses 18 through 21. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Daniel, for the scripture reading, and Brother Ralph for leading these beautiful songs, and Brother Langley for the prayer this morning. Indeed, it is good to be here, and again, we wish to all of our mothers and grandmothers a happy Mother's Day. We are truly blessed with godly mothers and grandmothers in this congregation. Though we not be not a large congregation, we do have a goodly number of of these godly women that we're thankful for. Today, we are looking at the topic, I'm sorry, but did you repent? It's good to say I'm sorry when we're in the wrong. But yet, repentance goes beyond I'm sorry. There's a song in the hymn book, I believe it's number 82 in this book, Did You Repent, Fully Repent? The Bible gives us scriptural teaching on what repentance really is. And all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The Bible instructs us on every matter, and that includes the one of repentance. I'd like to look at for a moment the importance of repentance. We know it is important because without repentance, man will be lost. Jesus made this abundantly clear when he said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. He repeated it in verse 5. We know that the opposite of perishing in eternity is everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but I have everlasting life. In 2 Peter 3, 9, we learn that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want us to perish, but to repent and to turn to Him. We recall how that Paul preached in Athens, Greece, in Acts 17, 30, God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. In 2 Corinthians 7 and 10, we know that repentance is necessary for salvation. Paul wrote there, For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. But now secondly, what is the meaning of repentance? True repentance involves a change of mind or a change of will. <coughs> we find this illustrated in a story told by Jesus in Matthew, the 21st chapter, verse 28, 32. I'd like to read that for a moment. In Matthew 21, beginning at verse 28, Jesus said, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father. They say unto him the first, Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that the, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. But go back up to this first son, when his father told him to go and work in his vineyard, he said, I will not, but afterward he repented and went. He changed his mind. He decided he would do what his father instructed him to do. That illustrates very well the nature of true repentance as a change of mind. 
In this sense, God may repent of that which He had planned to do, in that He may change His mind when people turn from their sins. We have an example of this in the book of Jonah when the people of Nineveh at the preaching of Jonah decided to repent, then God repented of what He had planned to do unto them. There in Jonah chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. It doesn't, of course, mean that Jonah, uh, God repented of sin because God has no sin to repent of. But it simply means that God changed His mind as to what He had not planned to do to the people of Nineveh. He changed His mind. We read there in Jonah 3, verses 9 and 10, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from His fierce anger that he, we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. God repented in that He changed His mind regarding the intention to punish them with evil, because they repented of their sins. So God changed His mind. We have another example in the book of Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, verse number 8, of this principle. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Jehovah God said, I will change my mind. But also, on the other hand, we might have a nation that God plans to bless, but they turn to evil. We read in verse number 10, And if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. I will change my mind. So clearly, the idea of repentance is a change of mind. But again, we emphasize that God does not need to repent of evil or sin because He has no sin, but He can change His mind. But man certainly needs to repent and change his mind and turn to God and turn from sin. Uh, every person needs to repent, just like Paul preached in Athens, Acts 17.30, because all have sinned, Romans 3.23. Everyone, as Paul preached, needs to repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Acts 26, verse 20. But in the third place, what precedes or goes before repentance? Now this is a necessary thing we need to understand. That when man is in sin, in order for him to truly repent and be saved, this must be precedent to it. In 2 Corinthians 7 and 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. A godly sorrow is a sorrow that is Godward in nature. Joel in Joel chapter 2 and verse 13 expresses this principle when he said to the people of God who were in sin, like, let me read verse 12 and 13 with it, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. The mourning and the weeping here, and rending your heart, and not your garments, refers to a broken heartedness over sin. We might sin and we might be broken hearted because of consequences that are coming upon us. A man may live a sinful and ungodly life and be unfaithful to his wife and family and she may leave him and he becomes broken hearted. And so he's broken hearted because his family left him. But he's not really broken hearted because he sinned against God. That's not true repentance. Indeed, one should be brokenhearted when he or she loses their family or something valuable and precious to them. But true repentance is first and foremost toward God. One is brokenhearted that they have sinned against God, that they have displeased the Lord. They have been in His disfavor. And that is what Joel is calling upon the people to do. 
And that's what people do when they truly have a godly sorrow. They look to God in their sorrow. They're not simply just remorseful like Judas was when he betrayed the Lord. He did not turn back to God. He didn't seek God. But the apostle Peter, on the other hand, he wept bitterly after he denied the Lord, Matthew 26, 69 to 75. But he repented of what he did and we find him some weeks later in Acts 2 up preaching the gospel on the day of Pentecost when the church began. And so there's a difference between the sorrow of the world and a godly sorrow. The end of 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Judah said, The sorrow of the world. Many people have the sorrow of the world. They regret or they are bitter for the consequences of their sins, but they don't want to turn to God. They may feel sorry for themselves. Oh, woe is me. Look at poor pitiful me. Although it's their fault all along. You ever seen people like that? And they, they express sorrow for what they've done, but they're not sorrowful toward God. Well, would you like to study the Bible and turn to the Lord and obey what he said? Oh, no, not right now. I'm not really interested in that. I just feel so sorry for what's happened to me. Don't you feel sorry for me? That's kind of what they're saying. Well, if you truly have a godly sorrow, you will want God in the picture. You will want to turn back to God. I believe there's a great illustration of this in the book of Acts, chapter 2. A great illustration. What comes before godly sorrow? What precedes godly sorrow and godly sorrow re precedes repentance but God's word and the preaching of it is what brings forth godly sorrow in Romans 10 17 so that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God if you go to the book of Acts in chapter 2 you see that Peter with the other 11 apostles stood up for to preach the gospel of Christ and we have Peter's sermon recorded there in Acts 2. We do not have any reason to believe that what the other apostles preached was different. But they all spoke in various languages or tongues that they had not studied before. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the Spirit guided them in what they were to preach. In Acts 2 and verse 4 we read how that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. There in Acts 2, verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This was being baptized with the Holy Ghost as Jesus had promised them earlier in Acts chapter 1 that they would be. But we know the line of argumentation here in Peter's sermon was that Jesus, whom ye killed, is the Christ. God approved him, but you disapproved him. God raised him up. Although you have crucified him, God raised him up. So you have rejected and killed one whom God approved, namely the Messiah, the Son of God. Look there in Acts chapter 2, and beginning at verse 22. Peter said, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye you yourselves also know, God showed his approval of Jesus by granting him the power to do these great things. And this proved that he was Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, by the many signs that he did. John 20, verse 30 and 31. He goes on to say, Him, referring to Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You killed the one that God approved. In verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding off it. And then uh, Peter goes on to set forth various Old Testament scriptures to show that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. I have listed these here on the paper. The various scriptures and prophecies that were fulfilled from Joel 2 and Psalm 16, Psalm 132 and Psalm 16 again and Psalm 110 verse 1. And Peter lays forth in a logical fashion 
the fact that Jesus of Nazareth, whom you killed, is the Christ, the Son of God. He is the Christ, the Messiah that you've been looking for as prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. You have put him to death. But then look at verse 36, what Peter said to them. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That was the conclusion of his sermon. The one that you crucified, the one that you killed, is the Lord and the Christ. You killed him. You put him to death. That's the preaching of the Word of God. And they believed it, those who were of honest and sincere hearts. In verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. That is, they were cut to the heart. There's your godless sorrow, my friends, right there. And we know it was a godless sorrow, and not the being cut to the heart like the Jews who killed Stephen in Acts 7. Because of their question, we know this. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? There in verse 37. They were ready to do what the Lord said in order to be forgiven. Hence it was a godly sorrow there being pricked in the heart. They were pricked with the preaching of the cross. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. They were pricked in their heart. They were convicted of their sin. And they were moved to a godly sorrow. And what was the next thing that they needed to do? According to Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. The next thing was Repentance. They were moved to a godly sorrow. They were pricked in their heart. And what is the next thing that Peter says they need to do? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This was the next thing they needed to do was to repent, to have a change of mind, a change of will, to decide, to turn from sin and unto God and follow His way and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. That's what you need to do. But you cannot get into Him without baptism, according to Galatians 3.27. You cannot have your sins remitted or removed unless you're baptized in His name for the remission of sins, as verse 38 indicates. Washed away by the blood of Christ, Acts 22.16, Revel <clears throat> excuse me, Revelation 1, verse 5. So we have a good example of here of godless our work of repentance unto salvation. On that day, about 3,000 of them did that very thing. As you read in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The end of the chapter tells us who did the adding and what they were added to when they obeyed the gospel. Jesus had said earlier before his ascension back to heaven, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. In verse 47 we read, And the Lord added to thee, church, daily such as should be saved. So as they obey the gospel upon hearing and believing the gospel, repentance and confessing Jesus Christ, Son of God, Acts 8, 37, they were baptized and they were saved. And the Lord added them to the church. And they were added to Jesus Christ, Galatians 3, 27. But now in the fourth place, what follows repentance? When one truly repents, he or she obeys God, like these Jews on Pentecost Day, about 3,000 of them, who were baptized according to Acts 2, 41. Like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 who heard Jesus preached by Philip the Evangelist. And when they came into a certain when they came to a certain water, he said, What doth enter me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. My friends, a person will never obey the gospel unless and until they repent. One must make up his or her mind, I'm going to change, I'm going to do God's will. I'm going to turn my back on the world and sin and my selfish ways. I'm going to obey the Lord. 
That's what repentance is. It is a decision to follow God and do His will and not mine own. It is a change of mind and a change of will. We also know from these scriptures that great joy and rejoicing follows the obedience that follows upon repentance. Like the Ethiopian eunuch who went on his way rejoicing. Like the Philippian jailer in his household when they obeyed God in Acts 16 verse 34. All who are in Christ should rejoice. When we have come into Christ, Paul said, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27 Everyone in Christ should rejoice because we're on the heavenward way. We have the Lord with us. We have the blood of Christ to cleanse our sins. We're in fellowship with God and His faithful people. And hence Paul would write to the Philippian brethren, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. Philippians 4.4 4. But we know that when one is truly repented, that fruits of repentance will be brought forth. Again, we go back to Acts 26, 20. Repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. This is what John the baptizer taught in Matthew 3, 8 and in Luke 3, 8. To bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. To bring forth fruit that shows you have repented. Take, for example, you have an individual out here that he's been... Uh, a fervent member of a denomination which is a false religious body although he's been sincere but he's heard the truth he believed it he decided to repent and obey the gospel and become a member of the church of the Lord so he becomes a member of the church and now instead of being a fervent member of a denomination he is a fervent member of the Lord's church the body of Christ and he goes out to teach his family and friends and everyone that he can about Christ and the true church, the true worship of God, and the true plan of salvation. He wants everyone to know it. He wants to renounce his old false ways and to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. You might have another individual out here who uh, likes to run with the world. Uh, he likes to gamble, we'll say. And he goes down to Tunica, out to Las Vegas. He likes to play the lottery. And he realizes that this is wrong. This is dishonest gain. It's sinful. I need to repent and stop doing this. So he decides to repent and obey the gospel of Christ. Does he any longer play the lottery and gamble and roll the dice, so to speak, the one-armed bandit? No, he has turned from that. And he wants to warn his friends who are involved in it, although they may not appreciate it, against such a sinful lifestyle. He is bringing forth fruit that's worthy of repentance. He's doing right now. He's obeying God. He's not still involved in these sinful things. The sad thing is, my friends, that sometimes we have people that come into the church but they want to hang on to their old sins. They want to be a part of the world and a part of the church at the same time. They like the blessings of being a Christian, but yet they want to enjoy the ways of the world. You remember Moses, he made a choice to reject the pleasures of sin for a season. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. There in Hebrews 11 and verse 24 through uh, 26 there, that context. Moses rejected the pleasure of sin for a season. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He rejected those things that are sinful and evil. We have another example of a person who is uh, morally upright, uh, someone that the world will say, well, he, he's a very good man. You know, he's a good neighbor, pays his taxes, he obeys the law, he grows a garden, gives the vegetables to his friends and neighbors, 
Uh, you know, he's a really friendly, nice fellow. He's honest in his dealings with others. But on Sunday morning, he likes to go out and wet the line, go fishing. Or he likes to get out on the golf course. You know, there's nothing sinful about fishing and golf, but if you put it before God, that is sinful. So he doesn't worship God. He puts these things before God. But because he is a good moral person, and people look up to him as such, he feels that he is warranted in doing these things. Well, I'm a good fellow. I work hard. I pay my bills. What's wrong if I want to go out and have a little fun on Sunday morning? As long as it's clean fun. But something happens, and this man wakes up. He realizes, I'm in a lost condition. I can't be saved like this if I don't worship God and I do not serve Jesus Christ. And he repents and obeys the gospel. He's baptized into Christ. And rather than being out on the lake or at the golf course on Lord's Day morning, he assembles with the saints. And at other times during the week, whenever the saints meet, he assembles with the saints. He brings forth fruit worthy of repentance. He realizes that old lifestyle is no good with God. That I've got to put God first. As Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. Last of all this morning, examples of what true repentance is and what it is not. Those who cease to do a certain habit because of earthly consequences, they may say, I'm sorry, but are not sorrowful in a godly way. They do not repent toward God. As Daniel read a while ago from Acts chapter 20, in verse 21, that last verse of the passage, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God. Now you got an individual out here, we'll call him John Doe, fictitious name. And John, he likes to go out, especially on Friday and Saturday night, he likes to go to the honky-tonks and the beer joints and the taverns, so to speak, and to drink and to dance. He doesn't take his wife with him either. And to run with women and some nights he doesn't even come in at all. And if he does come home, he's drunk. His wife can tell that he's been around other women. She can smell perfume on him and all that. And uh, so she says, well, I'll tell you what. Since you're going to do this, I'm going to stop washing your clothes and preparing your food. You can just do it yourself. Well, he doesn't like that very much. You know, it, that's unpleasant for him. I'm going to stop sending the bills, too. You're going to have to do it from now on. Well, he thought, well, that's, I, don't, I don't like that. But he keeps on doing it. So finally she says, well, you keeping this up, I'm going to leave you. That's what I'm going to do. And so he comes home next time. She's gone. You know, he's hurt that she would leave him and that he's going to miss her, he's very sorry for what he's done. He thinks to himself, I'm sorry she doesn't cook my food anymore, get my clothes ready and pay the bills, and I don't have a wife to turn to when I want one. So he's sorrowful. You know, he's kind of hurt, although it was his fault. And so... He goes to her and he says, I I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to overcome this. I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? You know, that sounds good, doesn't it? But he's left God out. Aren't you sorrowful what you've done against God? Yes, you should be sorrowful for what you did against your wife and your family. But what have you done against God? Do you have repentance toward God? That's not true repentance. He's sorry for the consequences that he's brought on himself. A person gets in trouble, they get thrown in the slammer, they get thrown into jail, oh, they're really sorry. Sorry they got caught. But they're not sorrowful toward God. 
They're not sorrowful in that way. Brother H. Leo Bowl says on this passage in Acts 20, All sin is against God, hence repentance must be toward God. The writer here does not mean to say that repentance of the alien precedes faith. Such a position would teach that men repent toward God before they believe in God or repent toward Christ before they believe in Him. But all sin is foremost against God. I'd like to turn to Scripture with you before we close, and you may want to turn there too. This is Psalm 51. This is when David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, 2 Samuel 11. And had her wife, Uriah, the Hittite, killed to cover up the pregnancy. He practiced deceit. He practiced murder. He committed adultery. He does repent. He confesses to God in Psalm 51, verse 4. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Well, did David not sin against, against Bathsheba and Uriah? Yes. Did he not sin against his own family and against the house of Israel? Of course he did. What does the Bible mean when it says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned? It means that sin first and foremost is pointed against God. Though whenever we sin, we must recognize this. Yes, we should ask forgiveness of those that we've done wrong to. And we should be sorrowful for that. But if we do not have a godly sorrow and we do not repent and turn to God, we'll not be forgiven. We must be penitent toward God like David was. The young man Joseph understood the true concept of sin when he refused to lay with Potiphar's wicked wife. He said to her in Genesis 39, 9, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Would he be sinning against Potiphar, his master? Yes. Would he be sinning against his wife? Yes. But he, David, uh, Joseph knew that foremost he would be sinning against God. My friends, I'm sorry I got caught and what this is costing me and it hurts others and I'm sorry <coughs> without repentance is no good. One may be a drunkard and need to overcome that drunkenness. It's going to cost him his family, his job. He's going to lose everything he has. <coughs> so he decides to get some help, which he should. That's right but he's not sorrowful toward God. He's not penitent toward God. He doesn't want to include God in the picture. He may help his earthly circumstances, but he's not doing anything to help his soul. And his soul is not going to be saved unless and until he repents and turns to God. Those who obey the gospel of Christ must truly repent upon hearing and believing God's word and then confess Christ and be baptized as we've gone over today. And those who have turned from the way must repent, confess their sins, seek the prayers of the faithful. Acts 8, 22 to 24, 1 John 1, 9, James 5, 16. I want to tell you this story that happened uh, several years ago in a place where I preached. Uh, there was a young family in the congregation. She was a member of the church, and he wasn't. They had two beautiful little children. And uh, this man had committed adultery on his wife five years earlier. And now, five years later, his wife's talking about leaving him. And uh, so he comes to me. He wants to study the Bible and be baptized, which we did. He was baptized. But his wife still didn't come back to him. He didn't keep coming to services. Now, what was his motive in his heart? Well, God knows his heart. But it didn't appear to be genuine repentance because he did not remain faithful. And this young lady, I warned her that she had stayed with him, supposedly forgiven him, and then wanted to, to put him away 
Five years later, I was warning her against doing that too. She did it anyway. After that, she remarried another man not too long over, uh, after. I don't know if she had him in mind or not to begin with. I don't know. But friends, we cannot mock God. This young lady didn't stay faithful to the Lord either. If we are going to be right with God, we must genuinely repent when we've done wrong. And our sorrow must be God. We must be brokenhearted over sin and have a change of mind and will and determine I'm going to obey the Lord and be faithful no matter what, no matter who likes it and who doesn't. Even if it costs me my life, I'm going to be faithful to Christ. For Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. If there be any here this morning in need to come to be right with the Lord, we encourage and invite you while we stand. And we'll sit. <coughs> Jesus is tenderly calling the home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam farther and farther away? to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. 
when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not in temptation. It was drawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthen him. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it would great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful that we can assemble around this table this morning and remember the death of your Son upon the cross. Lord, help us to be mindful of what it represents, that this, this uh, bread represents his body that was shed on our behalf on the cross. Lord, help us to remember that at all times as we partake of it. <coughs> Lord, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, we come to you now in remembrance of your Son, who blood shed his blood on the cross for our sins. We pray that all of us here take partake of this cup in a manner that is pleasing to your sight and respectful of that memory. And we ask all this in your Son's precious name. Amen. Separate apart from the Lord's Supper, let's all give with and prosper. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, thank you, Lord, for what we just observed, the death of your dear Son upon the cross. Lord, help us to give back a portion of the many things that you've given to us materially. Lord, we're thankful for them. Help us to give it with an open heart. That's just in Christ's name. Amen.
Let's all turn in closing to number 418, 418. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Danny, for an excellent sermon. Appreciate that very much. A lot of good thoughts there that we need to go home and study and think about. First verse of this, and if uh, Brother Daniel could lead us in closing prayer. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ the royal master leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banners go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus, go. Son's sacrifice on the cross that may be saved, and help all those on the prayer list, and help all those who are lost and may come to Christ. Forgive us of all of our sins that we have done. Help us to go on our daily walks of life and service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, Sunday. Good night, Sunday. Good night, Sunday. Good night, Sunday.